Good morning and welcome to St. Mark's. Good morning. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for coming out today on this very blessed day. And I wish you and your families a very blessed, happy, good Friday. With that being said, just want to wait for everyone to be seated. We come here as always to give God and only Him the glory and all the praise and all the thanks and no better day than on Good Friday when we thank the Lord for His Son Jesus Christ who came to die for our sins so that we may live. We wouldn't be in this church today if it wasn't for Jesus Christ laying down His life upon that cross to forgive us of our sins. And that is what we're celebrating here today, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. So please bow your heads, unite your hearts before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the great God of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega, the faithful and the true. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, even in your majesty, we know that you draw close to us in our pain, in our heartache, in our trials and tribulations. We thank you, Father God, that you are a counselor that guides us to make wise decisions. We thank you, Father God, that you are our comforter in times of sorrow and pain. We thank you, God, that your presence is always with us and you'll never leave us or forsake us. We thank you, Father God, for your love that never ends and your amazing grace that saves sinners like us. Lord, we thank you today for your son, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life upon the cross of Calvary and died a shameful death so we may live. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Today, Lord, we raise up our humble hearts and hands and voices to your honor, to your glory. Be your praise, honor, and glory to your holy name forever and ever. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. I ask at this time that we stand as we sing our first song. Our first song is called, This is Amazing Grace.
King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. seated. We take this opportunity on Good Friday to celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper with one another. I take a reading from the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. I ask at this time that you take the elements. We will first eat of the wafer, the bread, and then straight after that we'll drink of the wine of the grape juice. Let us eat together thereon. Let us drink together. And in this moment, before the throne of God, let us close our eyes. Unite our hearts in prayer before the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we have partaken of the Lord's Supper, the communion, we reflect back and look back on what your Son Jesus Christ did for us when his body was broken and his blood was shed, but a sin and through that blood that we have the redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you, Father God, for so lovingly and freely giving us your Son to die a cruel death on an old rugged cross but in that death brought light and salvation to the world. Today, not only today, but every day, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son Jesus in dying for our sins so we may live. And with that, Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. At this time, we're going to sing our next song, which is... Love, living he loved me. Living he loved me. Please remain seated while we sing this song. <laughs> One day when heaven was filled with his praises, 
One day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried Calvary's mountain One day they nailed him To die on a tree Suffering anguish Despised and rejected Bearing our sins My Redeemer is he Hands that healed nations Stretched out on a tree And took the nails for me stand for our next song, Living Hope. between us 
still some chairs in the front and two right here for the brave and bold, <laughs> the very courageous. My message title today is From Gethsemane to Golgotha. From Gethsemane to Golgotha. What I want to do today is for you and I to journey with Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane to the cross of Golgotha. And then on Sunday we will continue that story from the cross of Golgotha to the grave and beyond. Today's message from Gethsemane to Golgotha. It was the night before the crucifixion and Jesus Christ was in the upper room in a house in Jerusalem. And there with his 12 disciples, they were celebrating the Passover feast. And with that, Jesus then institutes the Lord's Supper. He takes the bread, breaks it, and he gives thanks. And he says, this is my body that was broken for you. This is the Lord's Supper. Then he takes the wine and gives thanks and says, this is my blood that was shed for many. Whenever you drink and eat this, do this in remembrance of me. After that, the apostles then go down the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. They spend some time there singing hymns and praising God. And then they go down into the Kidron Valley to the lower flanks of the Mount of Olives. And there's an olive grove there, a garden full of olive trees. It's a garden we call Gethsemane. And that is where our journey begins today, in Gethsemane. So let us open up our Bibles as we read together. Mark 14, Mark 14, verses 32 to 36. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not I will, but what you will. They went to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a combination of two Hebrew words. Get and Shemone. Get is a press. And Shemone comes from the Hebrew Shemin, which is oil. Oil press. The word Gethsemane means oil press. In that garden, there were many olive trees. So it would be natural to have an olive press there in the garden. And you know that the, the way that olives are harvested is actually very interesting. They're not picked like normal fruit from a tree. What happens is they will go to the garden of Gethsemane, where the oil press is. They'll see all the olive trees. They'll take a long stick and beat all the branches. The ripe olives will then fall off. They'll catch it in a big blanket or a big sheet of cloth. They'll take all those olives to the oil press, which is basically just a round stone trough. They'll throw all of the olives in there, and then they'll either have human beings crush them, or they have a stone, a stone that's in the trough and tied to a donkey. So as the donkey goes around, the stone then crushes all those olives. And that's where we get olive oil. That's the process of making olive oil. I don't think it's an accident that Jesus Christ chose this garden to pray that prayer. Just as those olives were crushed to produce the oil, so the very soul of Jesus Christ himself would be crushed in agony as he prayed to his Father. And he said, Abba, Father, you can do all things, but take this cup from me. Abba, not the band. I know that's what you're thinking of. <laughs> Not the band. Abba is Aramaic for father. The Hebrew is Ab, like in Abraham, Absalom. When you see Ab in a name, it means father. Abba is Aramaic for father. So Jesus was saying, Father, Father. But the word Abba is a little bit different. It's a word of endearment. It's a word of affection. It's kind of like a Jewish child would say to his father, Daddy or Papa. So it's a, a name of affection. But not only was it affection, it was also one that didn't minimize the authority of the Father. So while Jesus was saying, Daddy, Father, 
He was saying that as a sign of affection, but also not to minimize the authority of the Father. And he said, Daddy, Father, please, you can do all things. Take this cup from me. What cup was he talking about? Was it a real cup? No. In the Bible where it says the phrase to drink from the cup, it means to share in an experience, to have an experience. For example, if I was going to a hospital tomorrow for surgery, I would tell you, the congregation, I don't want you to drink the cup that I'm going to drink from, from uh, tomorrow because I don't want you to share in the same suffering and pain that I might endure tomorrow. Just before this, Jesus said to John and James, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And by that he meant, can you, John and James, go through the suffering, the pain, the death that I'll endure? So in the Bible, when Jesus talks about a cup and drinking from the cup, it means an experience. And this cup that Jesus was going to drink from was a cup of suffering. So much so that he did not want to drink it. So much so the agony and torment that he had in that garden that night, the Bible says in the Gospel of Luke, that he actually started to sweat drops of blood. And doctors say this is a real thing. It's called thrombosis. That means the capillaries in your forehead actually burst and the blood comes out with the sweat. They say this only happens to people who are under severe shock and trauma. Jesus wasn't even at the cross yet. And he felt that trauma, that shock, that agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, so much so that he sweated drops of blood. Cried out, Abba Father, take this cup from me. What was in that cup? What did Jesus see in that cup of suffering that he wanted the Father to take it away from him? In that cup he saw Isolation, emotional isolation. Jesus loved people. If you read the Gospels, he's always around thousands of people, crowds of people, flocked to him all the time. And he loved the common folk. Even his enemies said Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And thank God that he was. Thank God that he went after the rejects and the outcasts. Because if he didn't, I would not be saved. And I'm sure many of you would not be saved neither. Jesus did not come for the religious elite. He came from the common man, the sinner. And there, he said, take this cup from me, and he noticed that he was all of a sudden getting lonely and lonelier. The crowd started to dissipate. There was a time when Jesus fed 5,000 people. The Bible says 5,000 men, not even counting the women and children. Could have been easy 10,000 people. A little later in that same gospel, it says Jesus fed, said Jesus fed 4,000 people. 1,000 people disappeared. In a matter of days. He had a lot of followers, a lot of disciples following him. But when he spoke about the discipline of discipleship, the Bible says that many of those followers left and deserted Jesus. The other night before his crucifixion, he was down to 12. Where were all those followers and disciples that followed him? It was there alone with the 12 apostles. One would later betray him, one would deny him. In that very garden, those same disciples would run and hide. And Jesus would be left alone to walk that lonely road to Golgotha. Not only was it emotional isolation, but also physical pain. He looked into that cup and he saw the pain that he would go through. And I don't think we really understand when the Bible says they crucified him, what Jesus went through. Jesus looked into that cup and he saw that he would be beaten that his beard would be plucked from his face. He saw his hands be tied to a post and a whip being flung across his bare back. Tradition says that it was a cat of nine tails. Have you heard of that before? It's a whip with a handle with nine strands, leather strands, and in that leather would be woven little pieces of bone and steel. And that is what they whipped Jesus with. For every one whip, nine lashes went across his back. Can you imagine the pain of those bones and that iron being ripped into your skin? And then the guy starts to tug it out and he pulls it. Can you imagine the pain what Jesus would have went through? The Bible just says he was flogged. He was whipped. It was much more than that. Jesus saw in that cup those nails, those long nails been driven into his feet and into his hands. He saw him raised on that cross of agony. 
He saw the spear thrust into his side as the blood gushed out. And Jesus said, Daddy, please, you can do this. Please take this cup of pain away from me. It wasn't only the isolation and the pain, but also the shame, the spiritual shame. Jesus Christ was holy and righteous. And there on the cross, he took the very sins of humanity upon himself. Every wicked, despicable, disgusting, evil thing that any person has ever done since the inception of Adam and Eve, every wicked sin was placed upon that holy and righteous Savior, Jesus Christ. He had never sinned before. Now all the wicked things, think just for a moment of all the bad things that happen in this world today. I'm not talking about bad, I'm talking about the worst things that happen in this world today. And now times end by all the people that have lived on this planet from Adam. That's the sin that Jesus Christ took upon his holy body when he was on that cross. The spiritual shame, not only did he take it upon himself, but Jesus became sin for us. Let me read you what it says in the book of Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. God made him who had no sin. Jesus Christ was sinless. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. What beautiful words. But we don't understand. We don't get it. That he was perfect and holy and righteous. And he did not deserve to take our sin. He did not deserve death. You and I deserve the death because of our sin. But Jesus took it upon himself and he became sin. He took your sin in him that you could become righteous and holy. In him. Jesus saw the isolation and the pain and the shame. And he said, Daddy, take this cup from me. He said, I don't want to go through this. But I know that you can do everything, Daddy. Daddy, please take this cup of suffering from me. But then he said, not my will be, but your will be. Jesus knew, even though he did not feel like going to the cross, he knew that the pain would be unbearable, he knew that it was a necessity to save mankind from their sins. He knew that that was his purpose, why he had come to this planet, to die for our sins. And he said, Father God, that is the master plan, that is your sovereign will, and let it be done, not my will be done. Jesus Christ, still probably crying with blood dripping down his face from the tears of blood, from the sweat of blood, he goes to his disciples who are asleep and he says, wake up, the time has come. My betrayer is here. He looks up and there's Judas Iscariot and Judas walks up to Jesus and kisses him on the cheek. The kiss of betrayal. That was a signal for the soldiers to then arrest Jesus. They grab Jesus, arrest him, and they take him to an illegal trial in the middle of the night with the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin and the Jewish authorities. And there they interrogate Jesus, and that is where he gets spat on, where he gets beaten, where his beard gets plucked from his very face. And there Jesus says nothing. They take him then to Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas gets no joy out of Jesus and sends him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. This happens all through the early hours of the morning. The next morning he's before Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate sees nothing wrong with Jesus. He comes to the Jews and says, I find nothing against this man. What must I kill him for? What has he done? They cry out, crucify him, crucify him. He says, I won't do that. I'll whip him. So he sends Jesus away to get whipped with that cat of nine tails I told you about. He comes back bloodied, beaten, and bruised. And again, Pontius Pilate looks at the Jewish people and says, I've done this. Isn't that enough? Hasn't he then paid the price for whatever charge you've laid against him? And they cry out, no, crucify him, crucify him. And with that, Pontius Pilate, he washes his hands and says, this man has done nothing wrong, but I'll send him to death. But I wash my hands of this man's blood. 
But the next morning, just before nine o'clock, Jesus Christ is carrying his own cross up the road to Golgotha. And this is our next place in our journey, Golgotha. So let's continue reading in the book of Mark. If you still got your Bibles open, we're going to read from Mark 15. We read Mark 14. Golgotha is found in Mark 15. And on Sunday, we continue and pick up the story in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 15, verses 21 to 26. A certain man from Serene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Golgotha is Hebrew for skull. Um, sometimes you'll hear of Calvary. Calvary is the Latin version. Same thing, means skull. Golgotha and Calvary is the same place. They called it Golgotha, the place of the skull, because where the victims lay, they believed that that's where their bones and their skulls were left. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. It's interesting that in the Old Testament, there's over 70 prophecies predicting the Jewish Messiah. Over 70 prophecies predicting the Jewish Messiah. Do you know that Jesus Christ fulfilled every single one of those prophecies? One of the greatest proofs and evidence for this being the word of God is fulfilled prophecy. You know that 25 of those was just about his suffering and his death. Let me read to you one of them. It's just in the book of Psalms. Believe it or not, in the book of Psalms, there's a beautiful prophecy regarding Jesus Christ. Psalm 22. It says this. Now, while we're reading this, written by David, a thousand years before Jesus Christ, I want you to picture Jesus Christ on the cross, as chronicled in the Gospels. I am poured out like water, and my bones are all out of joint. My heart was turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like past herd, and my tongue sticks to my roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of, the, the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Isn't that an amazing song? Predicting exactly what happened a thousand years later at the death of Jesus Christ. Talks about his body being open for people to see and gloat and humiliate and ridicule him. It talks about the, the beating and the bruising. It talks about him being thirsty on the cross. Jesus said, I thirst. And then it says there that my hands and my feet were pierced. This was unknown to the Jewish people. Crucifixion had not yet been invented when this psalm was written. The Jews for execution and punishment by death would be stony. Never crucifixion. Yet this predicted a thousand years before the Romans even came on the scene that the Messiah would be crucified. And then he talks about those people dividing his clothes. Imagine that. That would never have happened. The Roman soldiers would never do that, cast lots and throw dice to, to win the clothes of any Jew. That was just below them. But yet, yeah, in Psalm 22, it predicts perfectly what took place at the cross of Calvary. As those soldiers did exactly that, they took his clothes and they actually threw lots, threw dice, to see who would win them. Psalm 22, a beautiful prediction of the Messiah. And it was at that place, Golgotha, Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. And now, uh, that verse 25, can you put that up there again, Marius, uh, from Mark 15? Mark 15, that, that same passage, we're just going to look at one verse, 25. It says, it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. It sounds so simple. It sounds so simple. It was nine in the morning and they crucified. So Jesus Christ was crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning. 
When we started this service 2,000 years ago, on a Friday, Jesus Christ was crucified. And that's all it says. So you would think that Jesus was crucified and then he died. But he didn't. Jesus Christ only died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. For six hours, Jesus had to stay on that cross in pain, excruciating agony. For six hours. Do you know that it was almost impossible to breathe on the cross? When they crucified you, they crucified your stick nails into your hands and your feet. Your feet would be on a wooden block on the cross to keep you up. The only way you could breathe on the cross is by pushing your feet up so your body expands, so your lungs expand, so you can breathe. So now if your legs got tired or you got tired, it would go down. Your body would go over, your lungs would collapse, you would stop breathing. That's how people died. On the cross. Suffocation. Now think about that. Jesus had to do that all the time. Push up and down. Can you imagine the pain on his feet? With that nail driven through his feet. And every few moments Jesus had to push on his feet. Just to breathe. And he did that for six hours. No. It's not that he was just crucified. That's too easy. For six hours, he stayed on that cross, pushed in himself up in the most excruciating pain you can ever, ever imagine. And he done that just to take one breath. That's what it says when Jesus was crucified. From 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, there was darkness all over the land. Darkness covered the land. Supernatural darkness. Just like when Jesus was born, there was a supernatural light that led those wise men to the baby Jesus. So in his death, there was supernatural darkness. In the beginning in Genesis, God said, let there be light. At the death of Jesus Christ, he said, let there be darkness. Oh, deep darkness there was. Darkness was always a sign of judgment. This was judgment. The judgment of the Son of Mankind as it was placed into Jesus. And unto him. And in the midst of that darkness, Jesus cried out, and the voices echoed through the land as he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. It's Aramaic. For my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, of isolation, of pain and shame, and darkness. Jesus cried out, My God, why have you forsaken me? And in the moment in history, in this only moment in history, God the Father had to look away from His Son. He could not take the pain and the sin that was driven into His Son. And for that one moment in time, God the Father turned away. When He looks, there is light. When He turns away, there is darkness. And there Jesus on the cross cries out his final word. It is finished. It is finished. It's a Greek word, tetelestai. Can you say that with me? Tetelestai. I'll say it ten times. Tetelestai. 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 It's a Greek word. It means it is finished. It's a word used for an artist who would paint a painting and step back. Say, it is finished. The telestai. It is accomplished. It is completed. It is finished. The telestai. If you just run a 10k race, when you finish the race, you'd look back and say, the telestai. It is finished. It is completed. It is accomplished. Jesus did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. What is finished? The work of salvation. That's what was finished. When Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ breathed his last breath and said, it is finished, he knew that the sins of mankind were upon him and he would die in, with those sins and in that he would forgive you and me. The work of the cross was finished. That's why Jesus Christ came, to die for our sins. 
It is not the babe in a manger that saves, but the dying Savior on the cross of Golgotha that saves. Amen? Amen. And when he cried out, it is finished, he knew that the work of salvation was complete. His job is done. The telestai. The telestai is also used in commerce. What happened in the times of uh, Jesus, what, if you went to buy, buy things on the book or on account, you would go to your debtor, he would write down all your things, end of the month you would come and pay him, and then what he would write over all of your debt, he would write to tell a sty. And there it's translated, paid in full. Paid in full, because the debt is complete. Paid in full. To tell a sty. The debt was paid in full by the blood of Jesus. Because you and I are indebted in sin. Our sins go high up to high heaven. And you know what? The bad news is you cannot pay that debt. There's only one person worthy. And his name is Jesus. Jesus Christ came to pay the debt that you could not owe. Jesus Christ came and across all your sins, all your wrongdoings, no matter how guilty you are, no matter how many sins you have, no matter how many skeletons you have in your closet, God the Father wrote over all your sins in the blood of Jesus to tell us I paid in full. That's what Jesus Christ done on Good Friday when he died on that cross. I've given you just a little bit of information about what Jesus went through. It wasn't that he was just crucified. For six hours, it was excruciatingly painful until Jesus succumbed to that death and cried out, it is finished. And when he cried out, it is finished, the work of salvation was complete. Jesus Christ done his part. My question to you today is, have you done your part? You see, because the only way you can receive that forgiveness of your sin is by receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There may be someone in this church today, someone listening online, who has not yet made that commitment, who has not yet received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. If there is someone in this church or online that has not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there will be no better day in this planet than Good Friday. Because this is the day when we reflect on what Jesus Christ done for you. But I'd like to ask those people who would like to make that decision today to repeat this prayer after me. For those who want to rededicate their life to the Lord, maybe this is your opportunity too. I would ask this congregation to close your eyes just for a moment. And if you are the one today that is deciding to give your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe that you rose again. I repent of my sin. And I receive you as my Lord, my God, and my Savior. Amen. And amen. If you prayed that prayer, I believe you got born again. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And by that confession of faith today, I believe that you were saved. Welcome to the family of God. You have done your part after reflecting on what Jesus done for you. Today is Good Friday. And we celebrate Good Friday. It is not good because of what happened to Jesus. That was horrible. That was a bad Friday. We celebrate Good Friday not because of what happened to Jesus, but because of what he accomplished in his death. When he saved sin like you and like me. Amen and amen. Thank you for listening so intensively. Let's sing our last song. Please stand as we sing, It Was Finished Upon the Cross.
Jesus on the cross of Calvary. He declares his work is finished. He has spoken this hope to me. Though the sun had ceased its shining, though the war appeared as lost, Christ had triumphed over evil. It was finished upon that cross. But the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. Death was once my great opponent, fear once had a hold on me, but the church says amen Amen. hallelujah please remain standing as we conclude in prayer let's close our eyes and out our hearts before the lord heavenly father we bow before your throne of grace and we thank you father god that we have the opportunity to come freely to this church today and in doing so we commemorate and reflect on good friday and we thank you father god for your son jesus who took it upon himself laid his life down upon the cross of Calvary that we may live. We are forever thankful for your Son, who is the way and the truth and the life. We know there's no other way to get to you, Father, than through the precious blood of your Son, Jesus. Today we reflect on his death. We know, Lord, that it did not end that way. We know that your Son rose from the grave and lives forevermore. And in that We are eternally grateful. On Sunday, we look back and celebrate the risen Lord. And for that, we praise your holy name. Lord, today, may you be with everybody in this church today. May we pray a special blessing upon everybody here, even the people listening online, that you bless them and their families represented. As they go out and enjoy the rest of the Easter holidays, Lord, may you keep them safe and in faith. Until we meet again, we will raise up these humble hands, giving you the glory 
giving you the love, giving you the honor and all the praise, always in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Hot cross buns. <laughs> Very important. Please join us in the fellowship area adjacent to the church for coffee, tea, and hot cross buns. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave.